Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of The Yard Tenders with Mac and Dan. I am Dan, he is Mac. Yes, I am. <laughs> and we do this podcast series in order to review pieces of art, observe, learn, and see what we take away, keep ourselves working as artists. And Mac had a very interesting pick for this one. Uh, this yeah. we're today we're, we're we are reviewing Siberian Lady Macbeth. It is yep. uh, a, vil- a film from 1962, also known as uh, Fury as a Woman. And uh, it's a Polish film, if I'm not mistaken, uh, directed by Andrzej Wajda. And I know I got that wrong. Um, but Mac, first and foremost, why do you pick this? <laughs> um, it is uh, Andrzej Wajda. Um, I, I actually picked I it. No, it's fine. I actually picked it for um him i actually picked it for for uh that specific director um in terms of i i i haven't really uh taken a very deep dive personally and i figured that we could do it together um we could do it together danny um take a deep dive into foreign film um and i i mean the, really the only thing that we've we've done here has been seven samurai i haven't really seen a whole lot of foreign films especially um uh french foreign films that's I feel like that 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 rules so much of the world, and I'm just so unaware of it. Um, so I started looking through, uh, reading as much as I could on just some of the best film directors of all time, like who who, who I should trust and whatnot. And so I came across uh, I came across Vida. Um, he is w- one of the most accomplished uh, film directors of all time, and um, and along with him, I started looking through his work and everything. And uh, my my I immediately was drawn to uh siberian lady macbeth um mainly because that that is a play that both of us know very well i mean in in um whenever we took an acting we we took an acting class together which is macbeth yes yeah macbeth sorry um whenever we were in uh our senior year we took a uh an acting class together and we looked at macbeth so hardcore once the pandemic hit um and so I, I thought that was going to be interesting because we both knew it so well. Turns out that the um, movie is nothing about Macbeth. Um, it is not related to Shakespeare whatsoever. And that was a very funny thing. Um, but I actually started looking into the history of it. Um, and it was extremely, extremely interesting. And uh, it w- w- would you indulge me if I was to, was to dive in? Oh, absolutely. Please go ahead. Perfect. So um, this actually came from... Uh, a book. Uh, this was originally a book uh, called. Um, I mean, it was it was Lady Macbeth of uh, uh, Matinsk, I believe is how um, they they pronounced it, or all of the uh, English speaking people pronounced it that that I was looking into. Um, that was written in uh, 1865 by a an author named Nikolai Leskov. Um, once he wrote that book, um, it was then turned into an opera it was it was uh, then turned into an opera in 1934 was the premiere and then uh in 1936 it gained a lot of international attention because joseph stalin because it was it was premiering in russia joseph stalin mm-hmm. um did you see this it, the movie or what, what? <laughs> no no no, no, no. Did, 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 did you did you see anything on stalin in, no, in, in no, no. i just i went into the movie cold and and that is all the information that i have good then st- strap in because this is a wild one so so joseph stalin goes to this opera that he hears is like getting a huge reputation um and he goes to see it and after he sees it he shuts it down He's like, no, that's we're not okay with that anymore because the play is so. Um, well, it, it it shows a woman leaving her societal role, right? Right. And and um, taking matters into her own hands, uh, specifically um, the uh, another thing that he found very very graphic was the uh, the sexual assault scene whenever whenever she's taken by Sergey and. She seems to uh, kind of be into it, but is definitely not giving any sort of consent. It's a very uncomfortable scene. And so Stalin found all those things very uncomfortable, and he decided to shut down the opera. They Basically, what they did is they changed the name of the opera, moved it to another country, and then just kept it running. And it, and it was a really big deal. Um, 
because of that opera, it was turned into uh, both the movie Siberian Lady Macbeth as well as a ballet. Um, and th these were all in different languages, you usually, you know, s kind of uh, uh, gravitating around Russian. And then finally it was, um, oh, and there was also a, uh, a Soviet version of Lady Macbeth in 1989. I, I, I would be so interested to see what that, um, what that looked like. But then it, uh, it was, it was finally translated into English where Florence Pugh played Lady Macbeth. Um, very recently for the Netflix uh, movie. Uh, and I, I'm assuming that you've at least heard of Florence Pugh's Lady Macbeth. Yes. So I was curious as I was watching this movie, um, thinking to myself, okay, so Lady Macbeth, the story then by itself seems to be um, taking influence from that is Macbeth, uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth to be specific. And so it yeah. kind of, I, I was watching this film and I was like, okay, maybe the, the one with Florence Pugh that came out a few years ago, perhaps that has a very similar story in the grand scheme of things. Right, right, right. And uh, let me tell you, it's the exact same. Everything moment for moment is literally the exact same from Siberian Macbeth, uh, Lady Macbeth to um, the Lady Macbeth that you saw with Florence Pugh. Every single version of the story is moment for moment the exact same. Um, except for maybe just like a few takes. Like in the Florence Pugh one, there was a lot less talking. It was a lot more like stares and whatnot. There was actually a lot more talking in the 1962 version that we saw. Um, yeah, yeah. And so, and so that was, a, I think, a, a very um, interesting thing. Well, I, I obviously, because um, we, we are both Shakespeare nerds, um, I was very interested in, okay, so why was it called Lady Macbeth if it has nothing to do with the play right um like what what that that, that is then the the question that is begged um and uh and then once i started looking into all of the all of the cultural influences that macbeth has had lady macbeth has had it, it started making a little more sense lady macbeth would kind of turned into a a term uh um a, a a descriptor an adjective almost to describe um women that um are either operating the machine behind closed doors or take matters into their own hands and live their own life behind the scenes and have like this public image. The most popular one being in uh, 1992, uh, Daniel Wattenberg um, of uh, a, a local newspaper in Arkansas called, um, <laughs> called Hillary Clinton, uh, the Lady Macbeth of, of Little Rock, um, which I think makes total, total sense. Right. Um, so, uh, Another thing that I found really interesting is that because because uh, yes the um, obviously he was he was inspired um, he was inspired partially by he was inspired partially by the actual play Lady Macbeth obviously um, and uh, he was also inspired by um, there was another guy around the same time 1859 which was six years earlier from whenever Lescov wrote the book um, and it was uh, it, it was a guy named. Uh, Tur Turgenev, I believe, is how you pronounce his last name. Turgenev, probably. No, it's Turgenev. Turgenev, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, he's a he's a famous poet uh, in in Russian history. Correct. Oh, really? Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you for, uh, thank you, Danny. Uh, look at you with your well read. Um, Turgenev, yeah. And so he wrote a short story called Hamlet of, uh, and again, crazy pronunciations. Um, Shigrovsky, I believe, and. Uh, and, and it was kind of the same concept. He took the character, the idea of Hamlet, and made it into, um, what, uh, translated it to a more relatable, more accessible version for um, Eastern European audiences. And so that was that was also a huge, um, a huge source of inspiration. So I, I, I guess I, I found my way to this movie because it was something that I figured we could sink our teeth into, but. But that it was just, and, and it was still great, but it was just something that was so different from what I initially inspected. So, so, so right off the bat, I guess I'm curious, because obviously we'll get really deep into it soon. Um, what was your, like, initial impression? The second the movie ended, what was your uh, uh, takeaway? Did you like it? Did you not like it? What, 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 was, what was your vibe? I think, um, I, I don't know why it gave me the impression, and I think it only gave me this impression because... Uh, it was a it was a foreign film from many years ago, 
uh, and the the pacing of it. I know I love to talk about pacing, but it's just how how the film itself was constructed and how it was directed was unlike a lot of things that I've seen. So I do not want to call this weird. Um, but I thought it was interestingly very compelling because not only was it compelling for the just the base story of it but i was also compelled of okay i was also in the same boat as you where does his name come from and so piecing together okay so they're using uh lady Macbeth as a sort of character construct right i mean knowing that this story is from a novel um decades previous right but knowing that and and kind of observing observing uh the character kind of go through the trials and tribulations she has to go through and her name is Katarina and i find i found it really really interesting and the, and the acting style was was different of course and it's always fascinating for me to under not understand but to watch another language at work and so just thinking about Oh, I mean, even even with the lack of understanding of, you know, watching Polish, right? But seeing them use the language as the text and 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 go through their scenes in that manner, you know, with me not understanding what they're saying except for the subtitles they give me, I, I think is is really entertaining because it, it it provides another lens into our work per se but in the grand scheme of things um i thought this movie was pretty dang good uh very very interesting on its own uh but very different and very unlike anything uh i i found it compelling what were what were your thoughts on it yeah i i i, I completely agree i think it was uh very interesting um i think it was uh uh, super well made um, based off of the Florence Pugh movie. I actually, uh, I actually preferred this one. I thought that it was um, be better made in, in terms of just the story, because I think that this one focused a lot more on the character of Katrina. Um, I, I, I thought that the that that clearly the director worked a lot more with the actress, gave her a lot more space to to do what she what what she felt she needed to do for the role. Um, whereas the Florence Pugh version, I you, clearly they 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 gave a, Florence Pugh a lot of agency, but they didn't like they, they they took a lot of really awesome lines and really awesome dialogue away from her, um, and they made it a lot more about the relationship between. Um, between her and the stable boy rather than uh, gi giving giving a little more uh i i, I don't want to say space again but um but a focus focus on, on her and what character. she wanted right 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 which which i think actually in, in, at least in my opinion quite undermines the 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 original intention of the story i think the story is a lot more about her than it is about the relationship between her and this guy um and and so i i, I guess that bothered me and and this and this did a, a much better job of that i also found um the the other huge inspiring force behind the original book that that i i think makes sense is uh because there's there's this one line in in the original macbeth and in, in shakespeare's macbeth that um lady macbeth, lady macbeth has that has always been it's extremely debated, extremely debated across cultures, across uh, like over time. It, it, it the, the debate is in the meaning. What does it mean? Um, and and that's a lot of Macbeth, to be honest. For for both the the person playing Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, there's a lot of lines where it's up to you. You have to figure out as the actor what that means to you. Um, and so it is the line: "The Raven himself is horse that crooks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements." Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here, and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Um, and and the more you read that, what does that mean, Mac? What does that mean? Well, the more the more you read it, I think it's it it becomes it makes a lot more sense why you would want to make an entire story about that one specifically. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the 
to the toe top full of direst cruelty um but what i saw in this movie is that she was willing to give up power for sergey for this guy it wasn't for power's sake that she it, it, at least that, that that's the impression that i got um would, would you would you agree with that well it uh, i don't necessarily see it as a giving up of power and i more so see it as her using the power the way that she wants to use it, mm. right? Um, so that she gained the power to be with somebody that she wanted to be with, right? It wasn't necessarily her giving up any sort of thing. Because at the end of the day, too, um, she's basically puppeteering Sergei, right? Uh, until the very end of the film where he goes back to his uh, lecherous ways. But... Uh, I, I, I more so saw it as her using her power in order to gain Sergei as opposed to relinquishing her power to Sergei just to be with Sergei. It always felt like she was in control of every situation and perhaps even in moments that um, she needed Sergei to do something, I mean, he was always going to do it. And I think... I think a big primetime example was when prime her time. sort of like nephew-in-law fell into this bucket of very cold water, yeah. I presume, and Sergei sees it, and and Katarina sees Sergei, and Sergei does nothing about it. But I think that's Katarina's like power influencing Sergey, I don't, and so I feel like if Katarina had relinquished her power and relinquished the power of being the owner of this little farmland or whatever, that Sergey perhaps would have done something about it, right? But I, I think I saw it more so as Katarina successfully making somebody do her bidding, and like of course somebody that she wants to be with right and somebody who brings her a lot of joy but at the end of the day she's the one pulling the strings strings and that's not that's not a slight no. on her at all i think that's just really good character i t totally agree i i would be thrilled to to get this character um yeah yeah and 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 so i think that that is what that 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 is exactly what the original quote means and 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 where the most interesting um layers of this character come from is Calm you spirits that tend to, that tend on moral thoughts unsex me here. Uh, I'll, allow me to um, act in my best interest with without my sex, without my gender um, holding me back with without without that being an obstacle for me because that is that is the main obstacle for Lady Macbeth. That is the main obstacle for uh, Katrina. How I've always interpreted the line is so if you think about like the come here you spirits or, or whatever the the exact line yeah. is is she is i mean how i have always interpreted it is that she is summoning demons to help her like obtain power or at least give her the power to hunt down power and so i kind of always seen it too as uh the end justifies the means that she is going to do now because she is just taking an opportunity that she is now going to do what it takes uh, to become the end-all, be-all, greatest of all time in this location. Yeah. <laughs> the goat. The goat, the goat of, uh, exactly. of Siberia, right? This was the toughest part for me, right? Is that I think one of the most interesting relationships that we get, right? Because... I think a huge issue with with the movie, um, with the story in general, is that there's not a recurring. I, I I guess I'm 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 saying that it's not enough like a video game like we were talking about last time. There's not a recurring villain. <laughs> there's not a there's not someone that you're like like a final boss that you're leading up to or anything. It's that she's faced with a person. She realizes that she has to kill them, and then she does, and then she comes the next person, and she realizes that she has to kill them. And then she does, and then she comes the next person, and she realizes she has to kill them, and then she does. And so the antagonist, really, if if we're getting into into text analysis here, is going to have to be Sergei. But that's never really um, 
but she never really treats him as an antagonist. So all of a sudden the movie becomes about, or the story becomes about that for me. It becomes about, she has this ultimate power. Why is she continuously deciding to use it for um, Sergei? And, and I think that that only really struck me because I was so... It wasn't as much the relationship between Katarina and her father-in-law, um, because that was the first main, that was the first person she killed, and that was the first main uh, bad guy, first main obstacle, I guess. Um, and it wasn't as much that the relationship was fantastic. It was more seeing the way that the father-in-law changed Katarina, to me, was maybe the most interesting part of the movie. I loved watching that actress in those scenes specifically. So I guess everything after that, I was like, she just continuously gets faced with problems and then overcomes them. And it kind of bothered me. I wish that there was something more for her to interact with, or if they would have spent a little more time on the obstacles or conflict that is present with that, 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 that is introduced to her by Sergei and the relationship that she has with Sergei. You were going to say? There are a few things to look at because um, this story draws a lot of similarities to uh, Flaubert's Madame Bovary, oh, the novel. Oh, okay, sure. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but what we're looking at primarily is the fact that, unfortunately, and it is legitimately unfortunately, that this is a woman who is a product of the times. Right. And so I think part of her using Sergey is because it definitely makes her job a little bit easier if she wants to uh, keep this land, per se, right? Yes. And... So I think a big reason, I, I'm sure that perhaps maybe I would have enjoyed the story more if there was more, I suppose, resentment, even though there is a little bit of resentment in the fact of the deeds that they are doing. Uh, and, and perhaps some of the deeds, yeah, they certainly look so easy. Um, but I, I think that that better serves her character development because for the first time in her life, Katarina is free. And I think that serves the story incredibly well. Sure, perhaps Sergei could have provided more resistance to her, but I think the big takeaway that we are supposed to have is that for the first time in her life, she had to kill two people and 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 be an adulteress in order to finally be yeah. free in the life that was constructed around her that for the first time she was able to perform her own actions in order to finally experience happiness for herself and not an extension by somebody else right. now does that mean she deserves sort of sympathy or deserves empathy for her actions does that mean her actions are justified I, I, no I, I mean she still kills a child yeah, at the very yeah. end and and receives the penance for it but I, I think there is still some sympathy to look at that she is it does feel to me that she is a woman of the times and that she is driven to this moment that yeah. and and i in a way commend her for finally reaching this freedom of course one would wish that she would reach this freedom by other means but i, I think that's that's the big thing to look at here in tor in terms of her reasoning for constantly seeking this power right so it's i think it's a little bit different than the original storytelling of macbeth that i do feel that in shakespeare's macbeth kind of i mean macbeth feels human at the beginning but to me he feels sort of like a cartoony villain towards the end of course he's losing his mind but we still see lady yeah. macbeth pulling the strings a little bit but i enjoy the story so much more that it's that it's primarily focused on lady macbeth because i think the most interesting thing that is in shakespeare's macbeth is the character is relationship macbeth. Yes, yeah. it's not only Lady Macbeth, but it's the character relationship between the right. two, and I think yeah. that's what propels the most interesting scenes in the play, yeah. is the scenes between the two of, hey, look, we're in this together, right? And so I think it's really fascinating and really enriching to watch a film that's primarily about Lady Macbeth, but instead with Lady Macbeth, uh, this Lady Macbeth here is like, hey, Sergei, look, 
you're here with me now, you're going to have to stick with it or else you're going to live a worse life, right? Right. And so right. I think it better serves uh, the narrative of this character. Okay, y y yes. Um, and and I, I agree with you. I am really glad that it takes a look at Lady Macbeth because I, Lady Macbeth does get the most disrespectful death and send-off in uh, all of Shakespeare's canon, like th every play of his. And for being such an important character right. in the story of that play, Brilliant such character. a lack of onstage time. Lack of on stage time and such a brilliant character, uh, like like we said, the most interesting part of the play, or 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 a factor of the most interesting part of the play, and then it gets an off stage death that's like one line. We, it's just like mentioned, like oh by the way she died of loneliness, and it's like uh, you couldn't have shown me that, like you couldn't have given me more Lady Macbeth. She's only in like the like the first and second acts. It's d d fucking disgusting. So, um. Yes, I agree. But you, you were talking about narrative. I'm interested to get your thoughts on what you think what you think happens to the theme of the story, the the uh the arc that Katarina has. What happens when when it ends the way it does, where she's going off to like she's she's going off to like pay the penance or whatever. Her and uh, Sergei are there. She is exiled her and Sergei to Siberia. Yeah, and then and then um and then Sergei starts floating with that other chick. He leaves um, Katerina. And then Katerina, like the movie ends her killing the other woman. What do you think that does to her arc? What do you think that does to the themes of the story? What, what the story is trying to tell us? I think what the story is trying to do to us there, and this is just my thought, is that she has instantly in that moment reverted back to a quote-unquote woman of the times where she has no power and the men around her control what she does or really manipulate her feelings and have no actual care into uh, who she is or what she thinks about. And so at the very end, we see the man who she has so masterfully uh, in many ways manipulated, but also loved. I, I think I think there is both. I think there is both mm -hmm. in there. Um, and we see him, for lack of a better term, betray her love and, and go after this other woman. And to her, she thinks to herself, okay, I mean, we went, you and I, Sergey, we went through such this terrible time together. We, in in a sort of way, belong to one another like we we are one sure right we we are a unit and to see that unit slip away once again because i mean sergey is a wretch and also it's it's but it's another motif it's another look at she is once again reverting back to men control the life around her and she cannot and I so see. i find her death as well as the other woman's death, who escapes, whose name escapes me. It's probably Vanya or, or some sort Sonya, of I think. name like that. Sonia, Vanya, Masha, and Spike. Spike, I knew you got me. Oh, you beat me to it. And so they drown together, Katarina and the other woman. Yeah. And I think that's that's her final like push into I am going to control my own life until the very last minute and nobody around me is going to perform otherwise and that's how i interpreted interpreted that situation I, I i guess that then begs the next question which is nikolai leskov when he wrote this book in 1865 was he that aware was he was he actually truly aware of the the capability and the potential of women in Russia at that time, and what was was he aware that it was going to be a comment, um, a, a a feminist comment, a a a comment on on the female experience at the time? Do you think that that was that 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 he was aware of that, or do you think that he stumbled upon that? I think the writer of a very good novel is well aware of each little thing they put into those pages. And I think there was, I mean, because if, if you think about it, 
uh, in in many ways. I mean, women have been operating the world one way or another. Uh, either the few who you know we know and we see. Uh, pro- probably the most famous example is like Cleopatra or or Lady Lady Elizabeth. I'm not Lady Elizabeth. Excuse me, Queen Elizabeth. Oh yeah, yeah. Or we have multiple examples, probably in his own personal life too, where there are women operating behind the scenes and that, you know, happy wife, happy life. Yes, dear. It's it's that it perhaps right. it's that sort of thing, but they but they are the ones that control the household and the one who truly controls the household controls the unit. And I and I think this sort of female agency, I'm sure I don't know the exact history of it, but has always been bubbling at the surface. And yeah. if you just look into the water, the answer is right there. Yeah. And so, you know, if, I mean, even if you just look back at Shakespeare and if you look back at Macbeth the play, you see, even though Lady Macbeth, if I'm not mistaken, she is the only female in that entire play, but to see her do her work per se she is one of if not the most powerful character there yeah. because i mean she is the one that helps you know push macbeth over the edge of murdering duncan and the becoming king and doing this and doing that right she helps push him over the edge yeah but oh actually no there's there is Le- lady Macduff. Wife. yeah there we go but, but that's like 0.5 seconds she's just like oh no yes. G- get out of the house little boy yeah but we see plenty of female characters super duper powerful in the home, right? We don't see a lot of examples of just females generally in history, which is a shame that uh, being powerful on the battlefield, uh, probably the only one really um, that we collectively, a lot of us know about would be Joan of Arc. But yeah, it- we see a character really pulling the strings and that is always going to be uh something that's always an interesting story and and how women take agency um is is something that i I feel like belongs more and more because you know the storytelling of wars and battles is always going to be more exciting and more of a a fun watch and ghosts and goblins and that sort of thing right at least in terms of shakespeare's time but we see women very powerfully at work probably another example would be king lear right right? it's that sort of thing it's that sort of thing that in at the end of the day, men want to tell themselves they are the ones in control. But at the end of the day, we all really know that it's the women who are in control. And we don't have the stories to say such. Uh, and I think I would like to believe that Mr. Nikolai wanted to tell a story <laughs> that revolved around that. And that revolved around a woman's agency blossoming into something truly more yeah and and um on on the subject of uh feminism and shakespeare feminism and classical text uh definitely 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 including uh siberian um lady macbeth i highly recommend a book um harriet walters uh brutus and other heroines um harriet walters is 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 very popular for having played every every female lead in every shakespeare play and then once she got to a certain age realizing those aren't the most interesting characters and then going through and playing every single male lead um she's very popular for a version of julius caesar that she recently did where she was brutus so wrote a book on it very very interesting and i highly recommend that um i i love so much that the uh that we have only talked about the story. We haven't even gotten to the movie yet. It's just been about the story. So I would like to now graduate from the story, lovely conversation, into uh, the the movie after we take a, a quick word from our sponsor. Cool? All right. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Now, just let me explain. First of all, it's free. Second of all, Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and a whole bunch more. And third, now this is really important, you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Hear me when I say no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. 
All right, everybody, and welcome back to the Art with Mac and Dan. So uh, we we left off. We we were talking about the story in the first portion, um, and and just w- what what the story made me, how it has evolved, how it translates to uh, uh, contemporary times. Um, but before we dive into the next section, I I wanted to make a comment very fast on. So so we this was on Netflix at one point in time. But we, once we started watching it, um, we found it on Daily Motion. Um, we watched it on Daily Motion, which is a perfectly legal website. Um, but the only downside to Daily Motion is that every five minutes, did you? Are you know what I'm about to say? Every, I do not. Really? Do you have an account to Daily Motion or something? No, I was just you know watching it on my phone or on my iPad. I, I can't remember, but one of those, a mobile device. Every five minutes, you get 30 seconds worth of ads. Oh, bummer for you, because I was able to watch the movie at peace. How? What the hell did you do? Are you in, cause it's, Is it because you're in Florida or something? I have no idea. I wish I could tell you. I was just able to watch the movie. Fuck you. So this is... The, the biggest problem was not that there was ads every... Think about how often that is. Five so every sorry. five minutes. Let's do some quick math. That is eighteen stops throughout the movie. Absolutely absurd. Um, every five minutes, I'd get thirty seconds worth of ads. But the only this is the biggest problem is that there was they only had one ad. Daily Motion only had one freaking sponsor. So they it, and it was only a fifteen second ad. So every time that it stopped, every all eighteen times, I saw two back to back fifteen second commercials for an HP laptop. Oh, anyway, sorry. I just wanted to get that out there because goodness gracious, that affected my uh, viewing experience. Um, do you want to get that laptop? Hell no. I I might want to get it just to like uh, do some really messed up stuff to it. I, and not just like break it. I want to break it in some really really evil way. I gu- I guess the movie did have an impact on me in in a negative sense. I think I want to put it in a microwave and watch it like watch the sparks and and just watch it explode. Anyway, um so you said that you had a question that you wanted to lead uh, this, this 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 portion of the conversation with. Yes. Uh, so it, it leads into my sizzle serve as well. I will open oh, with shit. my sizzle okay, cool. serve that will segue into uh, <laughs> a question for thee. Yeah, can we come up with another word for segue? Because we use that word far too often. Meander. Meander. Oh, yeah, so, pander. Like I said, I will I will lead with my sizzle, and then we will meander to this question. I like that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it's perfect. Okay. So I'm just going to say outright that the style that this movie did, and yeah, just the style of this movie, and so the, sort of the retelling of the story that is Macbeth in their own fashion. Uh, I prefer this over Shakespearean text. Funny you say that. That is exactly so. The uh, the woman that played that played the uh, Katerina in this picture, um, Olivera Marikovic, I believe, um, mm-hmm. and then also Florence Pugh and the director of the of the modern one. They all talked about that specific thing. They were like, "Oh, and this is. I mean, come on, this is way better than Shakespeare." And I was like, "That's hilarious! Is, is it is it specifically the the text? Is it specifically the accessibility of the language that that led you to that?" It's a couple of things, right? So, in terms, of, we also watch this in Polish. That's true. But yes, I mean, I when I'm watching a live action film, I will never watch it in English. Uh, if I'm watching an animated film, then most cases I am watching it in English unless Dubbed, the yeah. dub is superiorly bad. But <laughs> I, I the, the big bad. thing when it comes to me and Shakespearean text, and uh, I don't want to speak out of turn, but maybe it is for you as well, is that no, I love the text work and I love analyzing Shakespearean text and sort of digging into it. I enjoy it immensely when I have this breakthrough or this discovery of, oh, okay, I mean, it sounds fairly routine, which is kind of funny, but it's like, oh, okay, so this word is meaning this way in this particular concept, a context, but how it fits in with the rest of the sentence, okay, this is what 
I'm trying to convey to my scene partner or to, to the uh, opposing character in the room, right? I enjoy thoroughly acting Shakespeare and digging into it and, and all sort of faculties that revolve around doing Shakespeare. However, I am able to say this is what I believe about Shakespeare. Even though I enjoy doing it, I feel like it is one of, if not the most uh, self-serving thing to do as an actor. That I, even yeah. though the stories themselves are pretty good, at the end of the day, I always feel like, look, we can retell these stories in a different way that that fit more with the times. And so part of the treat, sure, of Shakespeare is the text. But in terms of if you want to focus on your storytelling and not so much about uh, perhaps putting your own spin on Shakespeare, if you want to focus on telling a story, then Shakespeare is not for you. And I find that uh, Shakespeare, the, the, the gem of watching it is to see how they do it. It's not so much to learn or to be blown back or to be taken away by the story. It's more so like, how does this actor do it? How does this director do it? Which, sure, fine, but I always find stories that stand on their own you know, that stories that stories that need to be told, the stories that are wanting to be told, I always find them to be much more fascinating. So naturally, I am going to prefer something like this over Shakespearean text. But let us meander then to my question for you, McKee and Wayne Welch. A full name, shit. So this is, as we've discussed heavily, a retelling of Shakespeare's Macbeth, right? Yes. Um, But I did find this way you know this this movie to do a beautiful job in both sort of honoring and i mean the the in the novella too honoring and taking liberties where you know the original author and you know the this the screenwriters of this film wanted to right and so i guess my question for you then is like how would you feel about more shakespeare plays being tell being told in a more modern context and sort of you know honoring and, and taking liberties because there are some examples of that being done poorly the biggest example is she's the man but that's that's another thing for another day i think that movie's awful but uh i i want i want to get <laughs> your fun. take on how you feel about reinterpretations uh -huh. of shakespeare's text sure um okay well i i, I want to start off with oh, holy shit was that a, maybe the hottest take we've ever had in the show i love that and because i think i i personally 100 percent agree with you i think that shakespeare's for students i don't think shakespeare's for uh audiences i don't think that shakespeare is something that you actually show people that you that you want to affect your change i totally totally agree with you there i think it's purely for people that are learning about acting, learning about directing, learning about writing to study. I agree. I think, I think, I think it is perfect source material and that is the extent of it. Um, and this, you can still enjoy a Shakespeare play, but I think, I mean, yeah, you said it perfect in, in the same way that, um, uh, if, if you are studying to be, if you're getting a, a degree in psychology, you're still going to be doing a, a toll. I mean, a serious number of, uh, um, uh, study sessions on Freud when we all know that we're not we, we don't really subscribe to many things that he says anymore like he he, he made a lot of interesting discoveries but goodness gracious that, that that's such outdated stuff but you still have to understand exactly who and who Freud is and what he did if you want to be a psychologist um, th that that's kind of how I feel about Shakespeare um extremely extremely informative but yeah I, I you, you can't you can't give that to people that's for students um so i love that take i just want to say that danny thank you um uh and and with that being said i think that i i actually liked this a lot better than the she's the man or the 10 things i hate about you types of um type types of retellings because those are i'm going to tell the exact story um, but in a modern way, which, cause I, I, yes, obviously the language is, is, is a, is a glaring thing, but honestly, nowadays we're used to a much faster paced story. We're used to, um, um, to, to a more focused story, um, that it, that doesn't have 
as many uh, characters and side plots as a Shakespeare play does. Um, and, and so I actually think I prefer uh, this, this style of um, taking a very interesting character or a very interesting relationship or very interesting idea from Shakespeare and turning it into something else. Like I, I, I like the idea of, I, I like the idea of Lady Macbeth, but I do not like how Lady Macbeth was executed in the original Macbeth. So let's make an entirely different story with that same idea, with that same concept. I love that. I love, I, because Shakespeare is the king of not having good and evil, but having just some some people. He doesn't do that in every play, obviously, but he has some very, very good examples of morally questionable people that are so fascinating to watch um, and so fascinating to dissect that I think that that, that, is, that is what I prefer. So I think that Siberian Lady Macbeth really does an awesome job at that. Um, are, are there any specific uh, characters or relationships that you would want to turn into something in the same way that it did Lady Macbeth? Um, not necessarily uh, taking the exact story, but taking the idea. Like the, the, the very first thing that pops into my mind might be like, I really think Cassius is one of the most interesting characters in all of Shakespeare. Um, I love the idea of manipulation um needing to ne needing the success of another person to fuel your own success i think that uh the 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 actually being able to truly justify murder to yourself and mur and, and and assassination that is a really interesting and very touchy subject that also gets me interested in like cults and shit like whenever cults murder people on like like on behalf of their thing their belief system i i think that's the same thing kind of um so that that's interesting to me uh is is there anything that rings in your mind in terms of things that you'd want to translate there are, there are like some characters in uh shakespeare's writings that are just a treat to just watch and see unfold, right? Even though I'm not like the biggest fan of the text, right? Yeah. Like, like from a viewer perspective, right? Uh, even though I in thoroughly enjoy dissecting it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I would I would say characters like Richard the Third mm. is so fascinating, mm -hmm. yeah. and it's and it's not not really similar in this context because we see in the context of Lady Macbeth that she is trying to find agency and power because. Everyone, well, hmm, now that I'm unpacking it more and more, but I'm gonna keep unpacking. Please, it. please, please. Uh, we see, we we see a bunch of men manipulate and and control her for the entirety of her life, and then she finally, for the first time, blossoms into this freedom. But how she gets this freedom is extremely morally questionable ways, which ends with killing a child. So that's awful. <laughs> but I mean, but we also see kind of this case with Richard the Third tiny bit because uh he is uh physically deformed unfortunately mm -hmm. um but he was born into royalty and is all backstabbing from the beginning but that is in a way sort of for like revenge and that is more of malicious intent as opposed to how i interpreted katarina and i guess lady macbeth the character trope that is uh from the novel that she is seeking freedom. So, I mean, but but at, at the same time, like, I would love to look at more of a Richard III character archetype as well as perhaps a Prince Hal, a.k.a. Uh, Henry V, with a Falstaff oh, sort of type where yeah. they're just, like, complete uh, foils of one another, but not the sort of foil that we saw in Berserk or The Master, not the foil in that sense, but a foil of, you know... I'm serious, and the other one is, like, cartoony, right? But but what we bring out of each other is super interesting. And so, like, I want to see more character archetypes that have that. And perhaps, you know, retellings of other stories, too. I think the telling of the story that is, and you brought up Julius Caesar. I love Julius Caesar. Oh, same. And I love Brutus and Cassius. And we know that the story, you know, it's called Julius Caesar, but really, it's the story of Brutus, and I love that. And I mm -hmm. would love to see 
more stories that are akin to that. So I think yeah, very, I very... Mean, the novel does a really good thing in okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take basically what I like from Macbeth, but this is how I'm gonna update it. Not only update it, but this oh, is please, how I'm please, going please, to please, yes. retell it in my own fashion in order to successfully convey a story that nowadays has more meaning that resonates with more individual individuals that and it becomes more powerful and i think that is so useful honestly as an artist mm -hmm. in terms of if your job as an artist is to convey the story and to reach the hearts of your audience members then that is the way to do it. I because I think the stories and like something like King Lear, right? Heartbreaking. And so a way to reach the hearts of your audience is better. If you want to better not only tell the story, right? Because you can tell the story and you can tell the story well with Shakespeare's original text, but if you want to affect more so yeah. than just the original text, then I think this is the way to do it. And yeah. I think even with that, right? Like, I wasn't super affected, I suppose, at the end of this movie. But I was... The more and more I think about it, the more and more it, it, I sympathize with Katarina's situation, right? Yeah. I don't sympathize with their actions. I certainly do not agree with their actions. And I and I condemn her and, and furthermore, Sergei for that. But I sympathize with... You know, it did feel that for her, she was driven to this situation. And even though she was opportunistic, this was her only way out. And so I find that to be a much more compelling story than Shakespeare's Macbeth. Even though Shakespeare's Macbeth is one of my favorite Shakespearean plays, I found myself to be thinking a lot more critically about what the character was doing yeah. and what that means for me as an individual as opposed to oh that it, oh wow how you know this acting company this theater company performed this play very interesting okay they did this right like i'm thinking critically in terms of the story telling and how um they did the story uh when it just comes to shakespeare's Macbeth, but when i'm looking at a different interpretation not only am i doing that but i'm also looking at okay, so what am I supposed to take away from that? And what am I supposed to do now as a person? And what did I learn from that? And how can I be better? Ooh, how can I be better? Yeah, and because that, that really is, at the end of the day, the, that's, 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 the, that's the biggest question. As, as, as mainly a director and writer, but I guess really any artist is, how am I supposed to make this um, uh, accessible? How am I supposed to make this something that my audience nowadays in this time and place are able to tap not into all it stories have to be that you yeah know? like i mean we see something like uh, the first one that pops into my head is ted or something or like the hangover right like sometimes they're fun rides yeah. you know but if if we want to look at something that but those are is still dramatic in it's storytelling and but it has something to yeah. say i think that's a lot more Th those are those are still even ted and the hangover those are still made with modern audiences in mind though like that the, there's always um uh that you, you always have to keep a very very um steady and critical eye on what am i making and who am i making it for and um and and so that, that i think that is what we're kind of coming to right now in our culture is we are coming to the very end right now in the world of of the Shakespeare era, meaning that we are in the transition of it's it's now for the very first time since Shakespeare was alive and writing, and it's now starting to become uh, really difficult and very rare for people to tap into it and fully understand what's happening in a Shakespeare play. The, the average person has no fucking clue what it's about. Whereas in the hundreds of years prior to right now, that wasn't necessarily the case. It was still very easy for both rich and poor people, both educated and uneducated people to tap into that. Um, and so now I think it's kind of a, a mad dash to, okay, what can we squeeze out of the Shakespeare era 
and take into this new modern era of, I mean, now let's be honest with ourselves, movie making um, rather than than uh, uh, theater making. What what can we take from that? Um, what have we learned from that, and how can we now advance it into the um, film era? And, and speaking of uh, year and era, um, it was very funny to me that 1962 in Poland um, is is like 1932 in um, in American film history. Like it was wild to me that this looked like a film from the 1930s, yet. It was in 1962. I was like, "Yo, we had, we had color by then. We had like Technicolor movies. We the the, the sound was so much better. The everything was so much high end, so much higher end. But it was funny to keep looking at um, Katarina because she still had a very American, Americanized 1960s look to her." And her costume and makeup, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so that that was I, I, I understand that perfectly. It yes. was very funny to see that, but with 1930s film technology. Um so, so but it was interesting because that kept putting me in the mindset of, oh, they're very far behind in terms of technology. So every time that they had a specific edit or they had certain special effects, I was always blown away, like Oh my gosh, how do they do this? But then I'm like, man, you got to remind yourself, dude. Like 1950s and 60s were like prime for special effects. You look at this in comparison to The Blob or something or like horror movies, it's absolutely piss poor. But I kept being impressed by special effects in this movie. Do, do, do you know what I mean? The, the techniques were around, you know, for the rest of the yeah. world. They just had older technology for this uh for this movie so the sort of the storytelling and the quality of the storytelling was still there but the quality of the actual literal film itself did suffer a little bit because it did look like we were watching a film from the 1930s right right um but for instance like at the very beginning now i'm finally touching on like the actual points of the film um whoops the, yeah whatever yeah i i i don't regret no regrets um, love this conversation. No wrong there, um, at the very beginning, whenever you first get introduced to Sergei, he is walking across a field, but all you see is fog, and then all of a sudden it rolls away. Do you know what I'm talking about? In the, it looks great. It's a it looks unbelievable. Shot. It looks fantastic. And I just kept thinking to myself, like, how did they do that? Because they're they're clearly shooting outside. It's not a it's not a stage. I don't think. And so I just kept being like, how would you have done like a huge fan maybe or like was it done in post? I don't think so. It was yeah that um was was a huge point for me and also in another one in terms of design. I loved how dirty it was. It was just so gross. There were flies everywhere. There were gnats. There were like like live ones in the shot. There were, you know, there there was like um, uh, he's like cleaning up that rat at the beginning that I can guarantee was a real rat. Um, it, it, everyone was like muddy and gross, and yeah, it was awesome. It was it was so cool. And I I see I I see that less and less nowadays. Um, that whenever there are rich people in movies um, from that 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 take place a long time ago, they're extremely clean. And it's like no, I money didn't necessarily mean cleanliness. You know, like that that was that's a very yeah. recent idea. It, 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 it I mean, and, and it took place in the same setting and time as Fiddler on the Roof, pretty much. And so I kept referring to that and being like, that tracks. Like this all checks out. This this is still aligned in my fiddler on the <laughs> fiddler on the roof knowledge of Eastern Europe in the mid eighteen hundreds. I want to speak on that. Yeah. That uh, in terms of like the gnats and the flies, and we see even a moment in the film that there is like a fly on Katarina's neck, and she tries to swat a uh, swat swat yeah. at it. Uh, and it's but it's just like that tiny moment that really helps and sells. Uh, the scene and the situation, right? Because, because the fact of the matter is, 
we are looking at a film that is in black and white. It is without color. So naturally, because of just how the manner of that is, and we live our everyday lives with plentiful and, and, and a multitude of, of colors around us, there is some of the storytelling and there is some of the sort of setting of the scene that is going to be a sacrifice purely because there is no color. So, okay, so then how does this movie counteract that? I mean, we see in Seven Samurai, right, like the big shots that I remember are just like shots with a bunch of movement in it. Not only would it be shots that would have like a fire, like a big conflict gration in it you know in the background right. a giant fire like those are shots i remember or just like hundreds of individuals moving around at once like those are shots right, that i remember right, right, right. that even though there was no color and perhaps color could have been enhanced it but the shot was able and the moments were able to stand on their own because of the sort of balancing against the lack of color. Right. And so with the moments like something as simple as the fly in Katarina's neck or the 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 gust of wind in Sergei's entrance, like moments like mm -hmm. that, that perhaps with color, they would have been cooler moments. But because without the color, those moments are actually, at least I think, are enhanced. And so yeah. they feel... A Very lot artistic, yeah. more powerful. So we see that rat that the father-in-law is just hanging there. And there's just something about the lack of color and just that black bob right there. That black blob that's just hanging right. there. There's a lot of more of that grossness. but we And we feel that a lot more because of the lack of color. Now, what's naturally sacrificed is it's harder to determine, okay, so what is like the temperature outside? Like what's the quality yeah, of the right. weather that, that they're unclear. living in? So there were still moments that like storytelling was hurt because of the lack of color. Yeah. But how the director, uh, forgive me the name, Vida, is that right? Vida, yeah. Vida was able to counteract the lack of color and the lack of the production per se. Yeah. Um, but the direct the direction and the storytelling and the acting helped counterbalance that and still provided a great work. Right, and, and people always talk about that. Uh, you know, whenever you have one sense taken away, all the other senses are heightened, and obviously that's bullshit. But, um. But it does uh, allow you to focus on other things, you know, um, and and I think that's very true of the of the color. It 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 pulls your focus to to new things because um, they they have a very limited tool, amount of tools in their tool basket now in, in, in their toolbox. No one has a tool basket. I'm so sorry. Um, but yes, absolutely. Um, so. Mr. Lavelle, what would you say is the audience for this movie um, nowadays? Who should watch this, and uh, what do you think of it? This is a very good movie. It's very niche. Find the acting to be good. Once again, though, it is harder to interpret the acting because of it being in a different language. Sure. Um, some 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 moments. Uh, feel, I guess, a little bit strange and some characters in some moments feel a little bit cartoonish. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I think the story itself is able to stand on its own and I think the direction to tell this story is also very well done. And um, even though the pacing is a little bit weird here and there and I do feel the movie kind of just suddenly ends and it takes a while for the stakes between Katarina and Sergei to really settle in. It's just moments like that that I think the pacing is a little bit muddled, but at the end of the day, like if you want to watch something that is different, but it's also at the same time extremely familiar, uh, and just to see a foreign film and sort of another interpretation of, you know, of like a language that you're not used to, then I can't help but recommend it. I think this movie is really good. It's nothing that I don't think that's going to blow you away, but I think there's a lot to dig into with this film, and I think it's very enjoyable, and I think you should watch. What about you, Mac? I would have to agree with a good portion of what you said. Um, in doing some research on the two main actors, the one that played Sergei and the one that played um, Katarina, both of them don't have huge resumes, 
uh, I, I mean, well, that's not true. They, they, they are very famous actors in Eastern Europe, but they're not um, particularly trained. They're, they're, they were more like just big faces and big names. Um, it, um, it, it would it would be like if you got um, like Johnny Depp or something. It's not that you get Johnny Depp because he's just the most fantastic actor. He's just a big name and a very niche person. And so I do think that just like you said, the acting was fine because I mean, even like whenever we watched Seven Samurai, we were able to look at those actors, even though we had no idea what they were saying, and say these performances, these specific performances, were fantastic. Um, and that you can't really do in this movie because I don't think that it was. Uh, I think there's a lot of hiding done by the director in terms of their performances because I don't think they were fantastic. But the directing was phenomenal. Um, and in terms of who should be watching this movie, I think that this is definitely a movie for. Uh, for scholars and for um, students of filmmaking uh, because I got to say, even though, just like you said, I didn't, um, I wasn't crazy emotionally attached to this movie and I don't even know if I would have been emotionally attached to this movie because of freaking HP laptop ads. Um, I, I learned so much from this movie, from watching this movie. Um, it really, really, really was enlightening, um, th mainly thought provoking, um, and uh, reminded me of what I want to to be making, um, in, in, including this conversation. So, 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 thank you for this conversation, Danny. And with that, um, what are we uh, consuming next week? So, it is a television show. That I, I honestly, I doubt you've watched because I feel like you would have told me at least one point in our lives that you have seen it. And I have not seen this television show. But to be blunt, it is commonly considered one of, if not the best television show to have ever graced this planet. So, Mac, I'm going to ask you the very simple question of, have you ever seen The Wire? <laughs> <laughs> I've you know what I've not ever seen The Wire. No. I I and it's funny that you say that because I have next week we will be discussing season one. Fine, okay. Whatever. Let's watch it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so what much, happened? Danny. No, 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 no. I'm excited. What happened? I'm excited. I'm excited. No, what happened? I think it um I th I think this is gonna be fun. It it I I was just gonna say that like I I I've heard a lot about you know break I, I thought you were gonna say like Breaking Bad or Game of Thrones or something. But it's just funny. I've never heard anyone say The Wire is the best TV series of all time. But I'm 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 excited. I'm excited. The Wire it is. Thank you, Danny, so much. Um, and uh, thank you to our listeners.